Today's video is sponsored by Crucible Magazine. I miss the days of standing in the game shop reading a white dwarf or dungeon magazine. That's why I'm excited for Crucible Magazine, a monthly magazine for 5e in print, PDF, and Foundry VTT. Packed with adventures, four-page comic, interviews, and more. Click on the link in the description below and get on board with a resurgence of amazing gaming magazines. What are you doing? I'm making a new promo advert for the Crucible Magazine Kickstarter. I'm making it for the fans of all things D&D. Don't forget to say it'll be out every month and it's filled with content for 5th edition. Of course. All things D&D. Fans love that kind of stuff. Uh, right, right. You're going to mention it will be available in print, PDF, and through Foundry VTT? Got it right here. I'm sure all things D&D. Fans will be happy to hear it's available in so many places. Yeah. Wait, uh, why do you keep saying it like that? Saying what? When you say the fans' names. Wait, is this the advert? Did you just leave a blank space and fill it in with each creator's name so it looks like it's personalized? But really, it's just a template? Yes. <laughs> That's really clever. <laughs> and now what you're here for. How my players spent two hours in the first room of my dungeon. Hi everyone. All Things D&D is back with two stories. Fun item interactions is seriously a highlight of D&D for me. Most of the time, it's the DM people cool with the barrels doing something they shouldn't. Like creating a ball-bearing shotgun with a barrel and thunderwave. Other times, it's the DM making up goofy items that the players get carried away with. Either way, I love them. Tell us your item shenanigans stories after listening to these two stories about players and how they interacted with items, in less than expected ways. Yes, as the title suggests, my players did indeed spend two hours in a single room of my dungeon during our last session. Before I get into why they spent two hours in this room, let me start by saying that this room was empty. There was no puzzle to solve, no items to find, no enemies to fight, and there was not one but two obvious exits to the room. That also doesn't include the entrance they had come in through. So you may be wondering why. Why did they take so long to move past this room? Well, this was a combination of several factors. Kind of a lesson to be learned from in the future about what you put in front of your players and when you do so. Firstly, I should point out that while this was technically the first room, it was the first room of the second floor of a more expansive dungeon. A wizard's tower which the party had spent all of last session fighting their way through to get to that point, and had just defeated a boss when we left off. So they were actually sitting in the boss room from the previous session. A puppet-like construct boss which was particularly nasty, what with having four arms, four weapons, and two faces, each with their own initiative. So the party was hurting on hit points, and had blown a fair amount of their spell slots. Given the situation, they decided to have a short rest to heal up a bit, which was just fine. Nothing I didn't expect there. The rest also gave them time to switch out their party members since one of the members, a centaur paladin we didn't have last time, was with them now, while one that they did have last session, an elf ranger, was not playing that day. So I simply used that rest time to say that the ranger ran back the way they came and pointed the paladin in the right direction to catch up to the party. This is where I made a mistake. You see, the party had come across a magical artifact in the lower floor of the tower. A very movable rod. Those who are well versed in D&D will know that an immovable rod is a very popular and powerful item that looks kind of like a cane with a horse head on the end and a single button. Pressing the button will cause the rod to become magically transfixed in place, effectively becoming immovable unless you can either beat a DC 30 strength check or apply upwards of 8,000 pounds of force on the rod. This item wasn't that, however. This was a very movable rod. For some context, the person who controlled the tower the party was in was a 200-plus-year-old artificer with a habit of making silly or downright crazy contraptions. The very movable rod was one such creation, and basically what they did is they just took an immovable rod and made it do the opposite of what it usually does. So instead of not being able to move, it becomes unable to stop moving if it's turned on, and then any force is applied on it at all. The players didn't know this, and obviously they're going to want to try out their new magical item, now that they have a moment of peace to do so. However, the ranger was actually the person who had the rod, and they weren't going to be there. Feeling generous, I decided to say that the ranger passed off the rod to the paladin as they passed each other. That way they could test out the item. That was my second mistake, since of course the paladin decided to try and use the rod right away. First tying themselves to a support beam and then pressing the button. Nothing happened at first, of course, but the second they moved their hand at all, the rod just went. 
I gave them the chance to make a strength check to keep it from slipping out of their grip which they made, and a dexterity save to try and turn it back off, which they failed. Since the rod couldn't be turned off, it just continued to pick up speed, smashing through the wall of the room, then another and another and another until it was completely out of sight. Then one of the players posed the question of what's going to happen if it keeps picking up speed, fearing that it might destroy the whole realm. Obviously, I'm not that mean, so instead I just have it become so fast that it loses its physical form and rips a hole in the fabric of reality right in the middle of the room where the players are. Yes, it created a wormhole. Of course, I mainly did it as a joke, but the players couldn't just leave a wormhole undealt with. So they started communing with their gods to find a way to close it before it could widen and destroy the realm. I had one of their gods give them a way to contain and stabilize it so that it wouldn't become any larger. However, once they knew it was safe to be around, they started jamming things in it to see what would happen. So then I had to decide what would happen. It started with a rock, so I just said a different rock popped out, because I decided it was connected to alternate realities. The players picked up on this and began to experiment more. One jammed a magic sword through it and I tossed out a magic bow, since our ranger was new and still needed magic equipment. Our warforged cleric slash fighter didn't like the short bow I gave him though, so he kept shoving until I gave him a long bow. Then the paladin decided he wanted to explore the other side, so I had to send an alternate version of himself through the other side dead as a doornail to dissuade him from doing that. Then they started shoving things from enemy characters they had killed into the hole, and alternate versions of those characters popped out, alive this time and less evil. So then I had to have those NPCs explain what their version of reality was like, in case they had any useful info the players could use, which I had to come up with on the fly. Overall, the session wasn't all that bad, and the players liked having the extra NPCs to help them in combat, but this is why the players can't always have nice things. This next story has everything we love about D&D. Math and a DM that regrets a decision that they made. Be me, forever DM midway through what ends up being a three-year-long, almost entirely homebrewed 5e campaign. Be not me, half-dwarf, half-gnome wizard artificer with necromancer aspirations. Rest of the party. So, a little bit of setting for this. I had made a lot of this campaign up, and one of the spells I had allowed my players was transmute liquid, which changed one liquid into another. Usually this was used for either turning random sludge into clean drinking water, water into wine, or the beer in someone's mug into moose piss. Hilarious prank, by the way, but story for another day. This spell was designed as a cantrip, as you'd only be making a small amount for yourself, but we had at one point ruled that you could change larger volumes if you expended a spell slot. Higher spell slot equals more volume changed. Throughout the campaign, I had set a pretty stringent precedent, that if whatever you're doing or trying to do would work with real-world physics, I'll allow it. This was about to go poorly. Cue my Dwa'om best friend player getting into a situation he couldn't handle. Being alone, having portaled onto the shore of a lake near the BBEG's lair, or what the party thought was the lair, in order to scout it out. The player was attacked by more angry ghosts than he could handle, so what does he do? He uses transmute liquid on the lake. Fifth level spell slot. Okay, I'll allow it. I want to see where this is going too. Five minutes later, we figure out that's the volume of an Olympic-sized swimming pool worth of liquid. 2.5 million liters, or 660,000 gallons for our Imperial friends. Still not sure where he's going with this, I finally ask, Okay, what liquid are you trying to transform this water into? Player. Knack. Me. Knack? Player. Knack. Much science later to find out what that even is, and many roles to determine if his player would even have a clue. He had been setting this up for a while in character, so he had made sure his character knew just enough chemistry that this would be easily possible. For those of you who don't know, NAC is sodium potassium, a metal alloy, liquid at room temperature just like mercury, but horribly explosive when in contact with water. A small vial about the size of a golf ball explodes like a hand grenade. This stuff ignites automatically with just the water in the air. My face when I finally understood what he was trying to do. The entire table was laughing so hard they were crying at what they expected was going to just wipe out the BBEG way early into the campaign. I had one final ace up my sleeve, math, to Google. We all worked on this, figuring out the explosive power of knack and water when combined, the explosive potential and the size of the explosion. The numbers kept adding more zeros. My players' faces when they realized the scale of their effort. An hour later, we finally had it staring us in the face, numbers that were almost incomprehensibly large. My Dwa'om asks if he has enough time to jump through the portal and close it behind him. Roll initiative. 14. Fine, you get to react. Other party members that were miles away, vaporized instantly. The rest who were in the tavern in the town, they felt the ground rumble, heard the explosion, and saw all the shattered glass. The largest non-nuclear detonation in history pales in comparison to this. Nearly TPK'd if it wasn't for the party cleric, who was away that session, 
so is in the tavern. No one ever attempted such a thing again. The transmute liquid spell is practically walled away in a shrine to never be used again, by universal unsaid agreement. Love it when a player's scheme literally backfires into their own face. I bet the explosion was glorious though. Please let us know what you think and comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel All Things d and Our videos are posted every 5 days, so stay tuned for more amazing Dungeons & Dragons content.